Yeah, okay, cool. Hi, my name is Taryn Feibick. Uh, I'm an adjunct lecturer in economics, and I am very happy that you all joined me for this extremely uh, always prescient, important kind of discussion about imperialism, exploitation, and the role of U.S. workers in the global working class struggle. Um, just to give you a bit of background, I also have done a, a, quite a bit of my education in, in development economics, which is basically, um, well, the department that I that I went to, it was pretty much the focus on value transfers between the so-called global south, which is also called the third world, and the first world or the global north. And so it was basically about the uneven development of capitalism across the world, how it is that people are being exploited, et cetera. Um, today, we're gonna be focusing a lot on what's going on in the US, and I'm gonna be trying to answer some pretty, uh, I don't know if I wanna say common, because I don't think that it's necessarily something that's spoken about a lot, but I have seen a lot of discussion about it online recently, so I just thought I could kind of throw in and give everybody uh, some, pieces of information that might help you uh, when it comes to discussing these issues with other people in your organizing or in your day-to-day -day life. So um, that said, I kind of want to start off by saying that American exceptionalism, this thing called American exceptionalism is very deep, right? It's very deep in everybody who is raised in the United States. It's deeper to different people depending on you know, uh, where you're coming from, what your race, your gender, your nationality, et cetera, is, what your experience of the United States is, but because it is something that is blasted full force at everybody through the media, through our education system, through a, a lot of society, it's important to sort of note that when we're talking about global economics in any kind of term, that this idea of American exceptionalism is gonna come through um, and we have to be mindful of that, whether or not we are on the right or on the left or wherever we are, we're gonna encounter people with these sorts of attitudes. And I find that a lot of the discussion that could be considered to be like ultra left nowadays comes from this place of American exceptionalism or comes from this place of sort of first world exceptionalism. And people might not recognize that, um, but here I kind of want to give you an example. So if you've heard people say stuff like, you're lucky to be born in America, uh, you should eat everything on your plate because there are people starving elsewhere in the world. The U.S. will never be a socialist country. Even if wages aren't rising, workers in the U.S. have more access to goods and services thanks to our global economic superiority. Uh, the U.S. working class has no revolutionary potential. You know, these are these are arguments that I actually hear coming from a lot of different places. I mean, I think that we can all remember, you know, back when that criminal Donald Trump was... Um, in office that he stood up before Congress and said stuff like the US will never be a socialist country. But I've also heard people who really hate Donald Trump and everything that he stands for also say stuff like this. And so I think it's important since we are all socialists based, uh, maybe not everyone on the call, of course, but I'm speaking from a place in the US. So I think it's important for us to confront this when we find it in different places besides coming from Trump, right? And it might sound a little bit different too. Um, because I don't really agree with these sorts of statements, right? I mean, obviously, and, and we'll get to a disclaimer part, sorry, and U.S. workers have been bought off by the fruits of imperialism, right? So you can hear that in a lot of different contexts and scenarios as well. And they can be confusing because depending on who it's coming from, you might be more or less likely uh, to, to think about it or take it seriously or have a discussion about it. And so this is trying to help people get ready to have discussions about it with people that you feel like can be won over to socialism in the United States and in the first world more generally. Um, and again, why are we having this discussion? Because these books here, there's this guy, Zach Cope, I've seen his name out there more and more. I've seen people, you know, referring to his works. He's an academic who lives in Ireland. Um, and he writes these books basically saying that people in the first world and the third world have nothing in common, that workers in these two places, there's no basis where they could work together. They, they share completely different interests based on imperialism, et cetera. But, you know, we're internationalists, right? And we understand that, yes, while some people in, in some parts of the working class have better standards of living or or you know, have, have a nicer life or a different job or whatever, or maybe they're located in the US, maybe they're located in Haiti, maybe they're located in France, that we all do have things in common because we are sort of under a global 
uh, working class, this is a world market that we're living in. And so we are part of the global working class, even people in the United States. Um, and so this is why I think it's important to have this discussion because I don't find this work, I find this work, some of it can be interesting in terms of, you know, the, the data that they're using. But when I, when I started to dig in to these books, which I've read several times and look at the data sources, I was sort of taken aback by how, um, I don't want to say it's dishonest because I don't want to, I don't want to put that word on, on the author or anything, but I was like, you know, this data is kind of funky and I wonder why it is that you're using this data to make this kind of political argument, basically that there is no hope for the U.S. working class. Um, and so that said, I do want to have like a disclaimer here where I, I understand that workers in different parts of the world have access to different goods and services and benefits and that obviously workers in the United States um, are going to have a lot easier of a time dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, because through pressure uh, in our class and also through the necessities of how our economy operates, we're going to get things like free vaccines, right? I mean, there are vaccines that are sitting around in a freezer right now. They say that they're gonna have to throw them out by the end of the month. Um, we get access to free vaccines. Uh, we get stimulus checks. Obviously the conditions are different, right? I'm not trying to flatten those out. I'm not trying to erase them. I know very well, not as well as someone who would be from there or who works there, but I, I, I feel like I know that yes, there are many different things. There are many different benefits to being born in the first world as opposed to a place like occupied Palestine, right? So I just want to make that clear. I'm not trying to erase all of those inequalities and unevennesses between those different places where we find our working class. I just kind of want to look at a little bit of the data here and then say, well, okay, why is it that you're using this data to make this kind of political argument? Because I think that this argument at this point in time is especially uh, problematic because, well, we live, in a, we live in a time where people are more connected than ever, right? Um, if not through the internet, then through the shared reality of global warming, for instance, or a global pandemic. And so I feel like now it's actually really important for us to recognize that workers all over the world have a benefit when it comes to uh, ending capitalism, moving forward into socialism, that everyone on earth can benefit from that, right? Uh, sorry, workers all over the world can benefit from that. And so this is why we're having this discussion. Um, so first what I wanna do, and yeah, again, I'm gonna show you some numbers. I'm gonna show you some charts. Don't worry about it. You can see I've, I've exerted this from the book, basically a screen grab. But the first argument that I wanna tackle that comes from these sorts of third worldist positions, and I don't wanna say they're third worldist positions because obviously the person who wrote this is not from the third world, uh, but from this kind of literature, this first argument saying that workers in the US or workers in the North or workers in the first world make too much in wages to actually be exploited, right? So that because I bring home a paycheck that has, you know, two zeros behind the, the number as opposed to one, that it's impossible for me as a worker to be exploited, right? And so these are some calculations that Cope came up with where he went ahead and said, well, I'm gonna calculate the average wage in high income countries, the average wage in low and middle income countries, uh, how many people are working there. Obviously, you know, there's a discrepancy in terms of, of population, discrepancy in terms of average wage. Um, the, the world GDP as it stands, then we can split up the GDP between, you know, high income and then low and middle income countries. He's he, sorry, he calculates the, the total surplus value, and then he comes up with this global rate of exploitation, which if you look at it, it's interesting because he then decides that, you know, the factor by which average developed country workers are exploited is negative 1.6, and the factor by which average developing country workers are exploited is 3.2, right? So through that, we can kind of uh, interpret that the reason why uh, workers in the developed countries are, are not exploited. In fact, they experience a negative rate of exploitation is because there's sort of a double share that gets put on workers in developing countries, okay? And it's interesting too, because for instance, he uses words like high income countries and then words like developed countries. And it's interesting because he doesn't really explain where he's changing up the terminology and why there. He's got this one thing where he says there's an average, sorry, there's an average annual wage um, and then the maximum wage beyond which no surplus value is created, right? Meaning that if you're making more than this, then you are certainly not an exploited worker. 
And he uses this data. And if you look at this table, you're like, oh, well, because the average annual wage for developed countries is $40,000, which is more than you know, $25,920. Well, then I guess those workers are, are not necessarily being exploited, right? Because workers in developing countries are being exploited even more because of their wages, right? So he's using two things here. He's using wages as sort of a, a, a barometer for whether or not you are exploited, as much money as it is that you're taking home. Uh, and then he's also using a lot of averages. Like I feel like this table is really ambitious because he has somehow come up with these averages for the entire global working class based on people who are making wages, right? And it's sort of interesting that you can, at the same time you're trying to explore differences or maybe uneven development, you're kind of collapsing a lot of things in on that, right? So if we look at average wages, in developed countries, for instance, there is no breaking that down by race. There's no breaking that down by gender. There's no breaking that down by uh, people who are paid under the table or maybe people who are migrant workers and they're undocumented. Like there's just a lot here that's falling through the cracks. He's just looking at wages and he's making this claim that, you know, well, if you make X amount of wages, then then you, you're not an exploited worker, right? And he's only looking at wages. And I found this to be particularly interesting because if we look at the wages of some of the most powerful men in this country, in the US, right? We can see that, you know, Warren Buffett makes $100,000 per year running Berkshire Hathaway. We can see that Jeff Bezos, who is officially the richest man in the world, well, he didn't get that way through his annual wage because he only gets paid $87,000 a year. You know, Michael Bloomberg as mayor of New York decided that he was only gonna take home $1 per year in pay. Uh, and then of course, you know, Donald Trump, he said that he was going to donate all of his $400,000 salary as president of the United States to, I don't know, to charities or something to launder the money to go to right-wing causes, obviously. But you know, if we're just looking at wages, then these people are not heavy earners, right? They're not heavy hitters. I mean, you know, doctors and lawyers and certain kinds of professionals probably make more than, than these people do, right? Certainly more than, than these two guys. Um, but you've sort of taken them out of the picture when you're just focusing on wages, right? You're not looking at assets. You're not looking at wealth. You're not looking at investments. You're not looking at companies or power or anything like that. You're just looking at the wage. And so again, when you're using these sorts of averages, you end up kind of excluding these guys uh, from the equation or worse yet, you know, including them in these averages and then saying, well, you know, it's going to affect one way or another. So that's the first point that I have that I take with uh, the wage argument. The second problem that I have with this wage argument is there's this thing called a maximum wage beyond which no surplus value is created. And he's saying that uh, it's $25,920 and $2,005, but that actually ends up in 2019 being $34,202. That's according to inflation, right? Um, and then of course the median income in 2019 in the US is, is is slightly higher than that by like $30 or so, right? And so that's that's kind of weird too, right? Because if a median income is something that's in the very middle, then that means that officially more than half of the people who are earning wages inside of the United States by this guy's own metrics are being exploited. And yet we're supposed to just say, well, there's no revolutionary potential in the working class and in, inside of the United States or inside of the first world because they're just paid too much in wages. By his own metrics, it's it's not true, right? Um, and so this is just kind of tricky and it made me think like, why, why is he using this? Because when people look at tables like this, they get really intimidated by it. They say, oh, look, he got all these numbers. He put it in a table. He must really know what he's talking about. But when you actually kind of dig a little bit deeper and look at it, you can see that maybe it's not as strong an argument uh, as it seems on its face. The second, oh, sorry. And again, we can see here that even when we're talking about wages, this is the disconnect between productivity and a typical worker's compensation inside of the United States. Uh, this is from 1948 to 2014. You can see here that in the 70s, there was this disconnect between hourly compensation and productivity, right? So before 1973, it seemed as though as productivity for US workers kind of mirrored or, or closely followed uh, how much people were bringing home in terms of hourly compensation. After 1973, there was suddenly this gap that opened up, right? And so now you can see that wages since 1973 haven't really seemed to have increased uh, all that much at all, uh, whereas productivity is still, is still really, really high, right? 
So again, this question of, of wages seems to be a little bit problematic when it comes to comparing uh, rates of exploitation, because there's just a lot more to the story than how much it is that's on your paycheck that you're bringing home every day. Uh, and this kind of adds into the second argument that I see him making a lot where you know, he says, kind of, I'm paraphrasing, who cares if wages haven't risen since 1973 because we have all this cool stuff now, basically due to globalization and imperialism and the exploitations of workers in the global south. And so here he's citing, this is an excerpt from another book that he has. Um, he's citing these two conservative economists who I believe work for the American Enterprise Institute or were writing this paper for the American Enterprise Institute. I actually read the whole thing because I was going out of my mind looking at this at these two books for a minute so i went and checked down all the sources and read them but this is his direct quote where he says that uh even though wages in the u.s may have fallen since 1973 as a proportionate share of gdp in real value terms the poor in that country were better off in 1999 than they were in 1975 and then he uses this as reason why right for example while in 1971 only 31.8 percent of all u.s households had air conditioners by 1994 it was closer to 50 percent um they they also demonstrate that the poor in the u.s have more refrigerators dishwashers clothes dryers microwaves televisions college educations and personal computers than they did in 1971 so he uses this to say that wages then did not shrink relative to the purchasing power necessary to consume these items, nor indeed to consume these items necessary to the reproduction of the worker as such. Um, and I mean, I don't, I don't really know what to say about this. I mean, yeah, like I do, I, we, we do have more microwaves and, and, and dishwashers and refrigerators floating around out there. But at the same time, since 1970, uh, you can see that the the total health expenditure, what it is that workers are, are paying out of pocket for, it has really just sort of risen astronomically um, since that time. So like, yeah, you got a TV, but what happens if you get cancer, right? That doesn't seem uh, to really follow there. And we can also see that likewise with increases in tuition costs. So he wants to talk about how more people have college educations. Um, yeah, I mean, that's true because the labor market has changed and now Amazon and Queens wants you to have a bachelor's degree in order to work in a warehouse. And that's a true story. Um, but you can see here that it has just gone up really astronomically, especially uh, when it comes to public college. Right. So we're not even talking about Harvard or Yale, which has, of course, increased. Um, but we can see that public colleges have, have gone up quite quite considerably and that the rates and how the increase has been is even higher than medical costs right overall and then the consumer price index again is this sort of rate of inflation so we can see that these costs are, are rising way higher than the rates of inflation over time uh, this year is rent median rents versus median household incomes we can see here that in 1970 um, yeah you know you were gonna have to it wasn't exactly like People, people were still rent burdened in 1970, but we can definitely see that by 2014, there is a huge gap between the uh, amount that you're supposed to pay for rent and the amount of money that it is that you're bringing home in your paycheck, right? So yeah, you might have a, a laptop computer, but if you live in a place like New York City, you have a, I think it's, I actually don't know this number off the top of my head. I think it's somewhere to like a third or close to a half of renters in New York City are, are are burdened by their rent. It might be higher. I'm sorry I didn't get that. Um, but yeah, every every city across the country right now you see gentrification is really intensifying and along with gentrification comes higher rents. And so you're paying more of your wage to your rent. Yeah, you might have a TV, but you're you're really hurting when it comes to rents, right? And that's something that has definitely changed since 1970. And then you also have this question of debt, right? And I, I just find it interesting that when he's pulling out all of these numbers to show how blessed and privileged uh, workers are in the US, that he sort of forgets how a lot of workers end up paying for these things, right? So we can see that since 1970, if this is the outstanding number of debts, consumer debts, and so this is student loans, motor vehicles, so that's car loans, consumer loans, including credit cards, uh, and then of course there's there's home mortgages, right? So mortgages is another form of debt, although it's a little bit different than other forms. But you can see that since 1970, these things have really increased astronomically. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that there are lots of people on the call, maybe not, probably not everybody, but I, I know that a, a large number of people on the call are gonna have 
college degrees. And if you have student loan debt, like I do, um, you can talk to somebody who went to college in 1970 and ask them how much money they needed to, to borrow to go to college, right? Um, and that that number is considerably different. And you can even see how much it's increased since um, you know, the beginning of the millennium that it's increased quite a lot. And now I believe it's a $2 trillion debt market student loans, right? So yeah, I've got a computer that I can take to class. I've got a refrigerator I can keep my food in. Um, but especially the poor and especially people of color uh, are very unduly burdened by student loan debt, especially at this time, as well as other kinds of debts, right? Because if you're not bringing in money because of your wages, right? Because your wages haven't increased, he concedes that. Um, then you still need to sort of afford to buy things. And so that means that more and more people turn to debt as a solution. Um, you know, as far as student loan debts go, I mean, I've known people who take out student loans, not because they need to pay for college tuition, but because people in their family have lost a job and they need to be able to make their rent payment. And so, yeah, they'll take out an extra student loan um, because it's offered to them because it's a huge debt market. So people, you know, saying that, saying that workers have, have sort of never had it better, that everything has improved for uh, workers in the U.S., it's just not true, you know? I mean, yeah, like you have a microwave, but you might also have $75,000 in student loan debt, right? And then you have to pay more than half of your paycheck for rent every month. I mean, this is just, it, he's using these really sort of shallow cosmetic things to say this is why, you know, life is better. And then also the part that really made me mad was that he was like, oh, people have more personal computers since 1971. And it's like, of course they did, because 1971 was the was the year that the personal computer was actually invented, and it looked like that, right? And so we can assume that almost nobody had a personal computer back in 1971, and now personal computers are everywhere. So of course people have more personal computers since 1971. It's ridiculous that you would say that. And then I went ahead and I crunched the numbers for inflation because, yeah, it's $750 back in in uh, 1971 but that's like over five thousand dollars that's how much this piece of metal costs and it didn't even come with a screen you know so like this is why is he playing these why is he playing these games why are you why is he pulling these tricks you know it it made me a little bit upset especially nowadays um and, it, and a lot of it kind of sounds like fox news i don't know if people on the call have seen this because it makes it around as a meme sometimes where fox news was saying and they were actually quoting some reports that that uh, this guy cope uses in a lot of his books um, these these Heritage Institute, American uh, Enterprise Institute reports to say that, well, people aren't really poor because 99.6 of them uh, have a refrigerator. It's like, this is offensive. You know, this is an argument that you would hear from the right, and yet people are ostensibly calling themselves uh, leftists or socialists or whatever, and basically using the same arguments using stuff like refrigerators and TVs. So it just, it made me a little bit upset, I admit it. Um, and again, it just sort of comes back to this idea of, of blaming, right? Because when, you, when you're looking at, at this kind of work, when you're talking about the discrepancies between workers in the first and third worlds, um, it's almost like the blame is falling on the working class in the first world uh, for the conditions that people in the third world are, are, are suffering under right now. And we, we know that that's, that's, that's not helpful, right? That's not true. I can't go to a workplace and tell workers that like, you know, well, your unionization effort is actually rooted in a place where you want to get more stuff, you know, where you're you're being selfish. You just want to exploit, you know, labor in the third world more. I mean, this is not helpful under any circumstances. And yet I've actually encountered this kind of line of thinking in union organizing, which is just out of out of control. And of course, this is not a strong union that I'm referring to either. Um, so so we can say that, like, yeah, things happened in 1970. Uh, that changed things like, yeah, okay, so workers got more microwaves, but then also we can see from the other charts that I showed you that a lot of other things sort of went up in price. A lot of other things went up in terms of rents. Um, so what is it that, that exactly happened? And first I wanna say that labor creates all value, no matter what kind of labor is being performed. So whether you are uh, pulling shots at a Starbucks, shots of espresso at a Starbucks, or you are building a car in a factory, um, that's creating value no matter what it is that you are that you're doing and of course there's the reproductive labor as well right people who are taking care of their families and raising up people uh, to become part of the labor force this is creating value right um, this is what it is that we are trying to seize back because it rightfully belongs to us right so I want to make sure that we we stick that there 
um, and that the nature of the U.S. economy has changed since 1970 in a way that was not beneficial to workers, right? So a lot of people would say that, well, you know, well, not a lot of people, but some people would say that, well, you know, workers have never had it better, right? Um, but the way that the U.S. economy changed towards uh, these corporations exploiting third world labor was not in benefit to workers here. And that's where you get the right wing argument of, oh, they shipped our jobs overseas, this xenophobia, this wanting to, to alienate us from the rest of our, of our class all over the world, right? Um, jobs were offshored basically in part to seek higher profits because there were higher rates of exploitation, but also to break labor in this country, right? If we think about the gains that organized labor had made, um, up until basically the beginning of the 1970s, they were pretty impressive. And so instead of these big corporations going head to head with uh, larger numbers of organized labor in the US, they just said, well, you know what, we're, we're gonna take our factories, we're gonna take our, com our companies to places where we don't have to deal with labor unions because maybe they're illegal. Or if we have a problem with the labor union, it's fine if the government comes out and like blasts them all away. And then also this idea that there were expectations around lifestyle and access to credit, these, these things changed uh, in order to help the US become the world's largest consumer market. The US is no longer the world's largest consumer market. Well, actually, I think that's up for debate right now. Um, but for instance, if you've ever had people tell you, well, why are you, if you're a socialist, then why are you using a cell phone? Because that was something that was created by capitalism, da da da. Um, I mean, you kind of need a cell phone to, to participate in the economy nowadays. You need a laptop in order to participate in the economy nowadays. If you are living outside of a uh, select few metropolitan areas inside of the United States, you need some sort of transportation to get to work, right? Um, most places have really abysmal public transport. So it's like, yeah, you're gonna have to get a car as well, right? And all of these things require access to credit or higher wages, right? And so if wages seem to be inflated as compared to wages elsewhere in the world, it's generally so that you are, are pushed into getting these products, right? Because that's what you need in order to be part of the economy. And it's an expectation that you have these things, right? Oh, also college education, like in terms of expectations changing around how you participate with the economy. It's like nowadays, of course, like people go to college because otherwise it's, it's going to be very challenging for you to find a job that's going to be able to, to um, increase your, your standard of living, you know? And I think that that's unfortunate. I don't, I don't like that. And I think that that's part of why college tuition raised up too, is because um, people started to basically need it. And so when people need something and if there's sort of a market for it, then the costs are gonna rise as well. So I don't wanna digress too far. While gains were made around uh, civil rights issues, the inequalities were already baked into the economy, right? And so even though um, it's a wonderful, beautiful part of US history, the civil rights movement, um, the movement for, for gender equity, you know, these are the really beautiful, beautiful things, but then it sort of turned around to say, well, because we went through this movement, because laws changed and it's wonderful that they did change, it's, it's a real like testament to our success when we can uh, fight together uh, for these sorts of changes. It, 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 as far as the market's concerned, it becomes a question of like, well, you know, what's wrong with you as an individual, right? What's wrong with you as an individual? It puts the blame again back on the workers as opposed to putting the blame on the system itself. So I hope that that comes across okay and makes sense. Um, here's another thing that happened, right? So this is a, a, a chart that says it's a services versus manufacturing. Uh, people who are employed in these things adjusted for workforce population growth because obviously the workforce has increased over time. And we can see that the service industries, the jobs where you know you're you're working at Starbucks or or whatever, some sort of service, um, have have increased quite considerably, while the manufacturing has dropped off considerably as well. And that was basically because you had um, people, you know, uh, sorry, I was getting a call. You you basically had. Uh, people being put out of work when their factories closed and, and the operations put overseas, they're still expected to work for a living, right? So you have this explosion in people eating in restaurants, for instance. It wasn't always that people would eat so much in restaurants or eat out, uh, but that sector becoming a, a bigger thing was in part because there are lots and lots of workers who are off looking for jobs. And as service sector work is a little bit more, <coughs> I don't wanna say flexible, 
but you definitely don't always know when your next shift is going to be. That again kind of requires you to go out and eat or get delivery or something like that, right? As opposed to you having that time to yourself, that set time, uh, which is something that the labor movement can give people. Um, but because, hang on, yeah, but because union membership started to go down, so too did the way that we sort of interacted with our work. And this is a, a chart that shows US union membership and income inequality. So the red line here is the number of union members in the US, and the blue line is the uh, percentage of income that's received by the top 1% in the US, right, these capitalists. And so you can see that when union membership is higher, uh, these this top 1% is taking home less, you know, but as union membership starts to decline, and this is where Reagan comes in, uh, not exactly the 70s, although it did kind of start a little bit in the 70s, you can see this dip here, um, but when Reagan came in and started to control the NLRB, union membership started to decline pretty, pretty poorly, and so also income inequality started to spike. Um, this here is a corporate profits after tax, and compensation of employees. The blue line is the corporate profits, the red line is uh, compensation, so basically your wages. And we can see here that even though over time from 1970 here, we can see that yes, you know, corporate profits were a little bit low and compensation was higher, uh, that after globalization started to take off, and especially after the beginning of financialization, when you started to be able to trade all of these crazy derivatives and make, you know, sell pets.com for $10 million or whatever, um, that then the, the corporate profits started to go up, right, as compensation was going down. We can see that that line is a little bit more variable, although here it's at an all-time high, uh, whereas compensation is, is going down slowly. So, again, so what, do we, what is it that we're doing with this information? Why are we even talking about it? These are things that um, I'm assuming that most of you already kind of know. Uh, why is it that we're having this conversation? And I guess the question that I have is, like, why are people... Uh, taking the position that there is no revolutionary potential in the U.S. working class in the year 2021, because to me, it seems like, you know, it's better than ever. Um, you know, workers today are more connected than ever. Again, if it's not through the internet, then it's through stuff like global warming, uh, police violence, uh, occupation, etc., cetera, uh, working conditions. There is plenty to divide us, you know, as, as a working class. There are borders, there are languages, there is race, there's gender, there's history of whether or not uh, you come from a place that was colonized, whether or not you come from a place where resources were overly extracted. Like, yes, there's plenty to divide us. And I think that it's important that we recognize and we um, respect in a lot of circumstances those divisions. Like, I don't think that everybody who has to, who moves to the U.S. has to speak English. I, I think we should respect, you know, people have their own autonomy, they have their own sovereignty. I believe that people have the right to self-determination, depending on where they're coming from. Um, and we can do our best to address these divisions, because obviously we can't solve a lot of the problems of what it is that divides us while we're living under a system that basically thrives off of dividing our class, you know, until capitalism is 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 in the garbage bin we're going to be dealing with a lot of these divisions and even afterwards even after we move on as a species we move past capitalism there's going to be a lot that divides us you know so we can do our best to address those divisions while also building towards unified purpose in a way that avoids exceptionalism and or chauvinism right so again to respect people's you know rights to self-determination under certain circumstances etc i'm just saying that like you know, white people, they don't deserve self-determination or, or autonomy or anything like that. That's that's different. But I'm just saying that, like, you know, taking it uh, piece by piece, we can look to see what it is that we can all agree on might be important, right? And I think that the recent elections in uh, Peru, I know that we don't have all of the information yet, that not everything has been written, um, but you can see the ways that, like, yes, of course, people have differences, but they do want to find things that they can unite around to sort of improve uh, conditions of workers and peasants, etc. So this is a great example. Um, I think that the global fight against racism is a really good way that people have found common cause and also ways to sort of make connections. And so on the left side of your screen is a poster from the UK, um, which is basically a, a march against apartheid or a boycott, sorry, against uh, apartheid in, in South Africa. And I think it's great that, you know, I, I mean, it's it's neat for me because a lot of a lot of young people that I encounter are actually learning more about South Africa 
uh, and what apartheid is through the struggle of what's going on in Palestine right now, right? Because they're using words like boycott, divestment, sanctions, uh, apartheid. These are these are two struggles that are in totally different parts of the world that have totally different uh, people in, in the working class. You know, they're dealing with different issues, but they're able to sort of make these connections between them. And I honestly think, you know, I've I love Palestine. I've I've been I've always not always but for most of my adulthood I've been really kind of committed to to doing what I can to to raise awareness about the apartheid that's happening in Palestine but I think that part of the recent success in terms of mobilization and activism um, around Palestine during the the beginning of I, I don't know if it's an intifada yet but what was happening recently uh, not just in Gaza but inside of, of uh, you know occupied Palestine um, that a lot of the reason why it got so much widespread acceptance or people came to a different kind of understanding about it in the US is because of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? This is another way that people can kind of make connections and say, well, it's messed up when people get gentrified out of their houses or their apartments in a place where their family has lived forever. And so, yeah, like in Palestine, that's what's happening too. And I just wanted to show this photo because this is the um, apartheid wall that's between the West Bank and Jerusalem. And here, some Palestinian artists have painted a portrait of George Floyd on there to sort of, again, make these connections between what it is that we're struggling for, no matter where we are at. Um, war, anti-war movement is a really important one too. So this here is a recent uh, action that was taking place in Belfast. They have a campaign right now around why it's important to end the blockade on Cuba. And I think that the Irish experience you know, that they've been able to look back over the period of colonization and imperialism between Ireland and uh, the UK or England, basically. And they've been able to see how that kind of relates a little bit to Cuba's history with the United States, right? And so they have found a way to make the connection. Um, I think that this is a great banner. You know, we won't fight another rich man's war. These are our workers, basically, who are saying that they don't want to, to go off and fight and die for a purpose that's basically going to make some people rich, right? And I like the Latuff cartoon because it's good for a few and it's bad for most, right? So war, again, anti-war movement is, is generally productive in terms of being able to make connections. Um, but I feel like labor involvement is really, really key with this, right? And I like this because this is let all trade be fair trade. And this actually comes from the anti-globalization movement, which was kind of snuffed out, uh, well, not snuffed out, but snuffed out of the headlines, I guess, after 9-11, because I guess people kind of like moved over to that. But it was to say that like, yeah, globalization, even though, yes, we can all talk to each other now, we can we can build these, these close links is bad for labor everywhere, right? So to say that let all trade be fair trade is good. Um, but labor involvement is, is key in these sorts of connections because movements that attach international demands to labor solidarity are more successful in their struggles, right? So I think it's meaningful that, especially around apartheid South Africa, you had a ton of labor involvement, right, to actively organize against apartheid. It wasn't just, and I, I respect and I love and I've been to lots of protests, you know, but what is it that really kind of pushes uh, these issues forward is it's when labor decides that they're not going to unload ships right? They're not going to accept products. They're not going to work on certain things. They're not going to manufacture guns and bombs that are going to be used against people in another part of the world. That's really powerful. That has teeth, right? When, when labor is in motion, uh, these sorts of demands have teeth. And so I guess, you know, to just sort of sum it up, and I think we have a little bit of time for discussion. Um, to sort of sum it up, I just want to say, you know, it's up to us no matter where we are, because I think that part of what is so um, detrimental and kind of, I don't know if it's like destructive or whatever, it's demoralizing, right? Because people will say, well, but if workers in the U.S., if they're never going to be revolutionary because they have a racist settler colonial history and because they live off of, you know, the stolen labor or sorry the stolen value that's extracted from labor in the third world then you're basically saying that i might as well go and work in advertising right because if it's if it's a lost hope then like what is it that i'm doing here if i if i don't want to be an insurrectionist or if i don't want to you know go to jail for the rest of my life or if i don't want to alienate everybody around me well then i might as well just sort of live life right i mean what's the point of of trying to be uh, a socialist if it's a foregone conclusion that it's it's useless that it's hopeless right um, and so I think it's important to say that like, no, no matter where we are, 
we can do things to build global solidarity against capitalism and for socialism, right? Um, and so I wanted to sort of offer up these questions. I have three questions, but I'm going to kind of reveal them, and then we can we can I guess deal will take stack, and we can we can kind of discuss it. But what opportunities do we have, right? I don't want to speak for 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 everyone on the call, but what opportunities do we have at this moment right now to build these kind of links and to connect what it is that uh, that capitalism does to exploit us? What opportunities do we have to to build that globally that previous generations did not have, right? So I guess we can open stack for that. I'm gonna drink some water. Okay, uh, we will open the floor for discussion. If you would like to, uh, uh, questions and comments, if you would like to present a question uh, or raise a uh, comment, then please uh, click the picture of the hand. Click the hand icon, to, that will let us know that you want to speak and we will be able to open your mic. Please keep your question or comment, uh, please make your question or comment brief. And uh, Sorry, Dee, could I, could I say that maybe we only spend about 10 minutes on this one question before you move to the next one? Okay, so, and uh, let me suggest that we take a few people and then turn the mic back to you, okay. Um, Joel, your mic is open. Um, my question is about the data you presented. So it's not really about the question that you posed, um, but maybe it is in a way. Um, you, you, your data, your, your analysis of Cope's data about wages was, uh, I, th I thought, masterful takedown. Um, but my question is that when we start to look at uh, data about wages and data about wealth, and how differentiated they are within the U.S. working class by race, especially by gender, and the intersection of race. How does that complicate uh, the on the on the issue of wages, particularly, but on the each issue of wealth, the, the disparities in wealth, um, even even within sections of the working class, are dramatically like the gaps are enormous when we look at them by race. How is, how does that complicate? Um, your argument and how does that reveal new opportunities? I guess turning the question back to that particular thing. So, thanks. Okay, let's take a few more. Javi, your, your mic is open. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, involved in solidarity work for a while, going all the way back to CSPES, for example, and the November 29th uh, Committee for Palestine. Uh, it seems to me that we've got multiple opportunities for solidarity work now that we really didn't have before, many times thanks to social media. Is this Does this remain a valid uh, channel in your opinion, and how could we uh, perhaps bring the the economic uh, issues to bear more more directly. Okay, let's take one more. Dante, your mic is open. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Taryn, so much for this uh, amazing talk. It's uh, Timely, excuse me, I'm eating dinner right now. Um, so just uh, uh, contribute to your question first before I ask my own. Um, yeah, I think I would add, uh, well, I would just uh, ditto what the previous person just said, uh, definitely technology and social media, uh, but that actually goes into my question, which is, you know, this, this ultra left argument, which you're kind of uh, fighting against um, in terms of, you know, Global North, quote unquote, workers uh, do not benefit. I'm sorry, do benefit from imperialism. That's the ultra left argument, right? Um, which, I, which I think is, you know, excuse my language, but horseshit. Uh, given all the data you basically said, right, which is, you know, uh, austerity and like debt, uh, which people suffer from here, 
and that's happening to workers in imperialist countries too with you know the imf and all these things too right um and then economic restrictions so yeah it, it's probably way more extreme but then the question becomes a question of as marxist uh, historical development of that country right so obviously the u.s is way more developed as a capitalist country obviously we have a lot of billionaires here and a lot of those uh, and a lot of consumers which we're obviously going to uh have access to in a sense um and due to a u.s imperialism uh countries like in what we call some call the global south or you know africa uh parts of uh, asia uh, latin america you know uh are what some will call like heavily underdeveloped right and this is the reason why you know uh these workers you know quote unquote don't have access to these sort of consumer commodities right so uh that it's an argument of development not an argument of <laughs> someone here in the u.s is benefiting from imperialism like we're not becoming billionaires because we have access to an iphone like that's complete uh bullshit um and uh you know workers here in the u.s have uh a direct relationship and connection to people in either colonized countries or uh, workers in other uh, countries and yeah we should be fighting folks that are heavily exploited under monopoly capitalism and u.s imperialism so um you know this is a, a global internationalist fight not a go it alone strategy which some folks think they can do you know like people like to separate themselves like you know there's you know black nationalists there's uh you know, Latinx nationalists, there's uh, even white leftists that hate themselves so much that they <laughs> uh, they want to, you know, oh, everything, I, white workers can't do anything. They have, like you said, no revolutionary potential. So they just give up. They just want to scream online and to avoid and, and so, sorry, D, I'm talking too much, but, um, you know, they want to scream online and to avoid and say all this crap. And then, you know, they just completely demobilized and go into a meeting if they show up and just become wreckers, you know um and you know kind of just demoralize people and, and confuse people so the question i actually have is how do we as the cpusa combat this confusion because some of these opportunists confuse the hell out of people especially youth that are becoming radicalized and they confuse the shit out of them especially during this pandemic period because everyone's online so they see all this crap on twitter social media you know, there's this one group, uh, what is it, anti-conquista, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's, you know, this ultra-left Latinx group, I don't know where the hell they're based, but they're crazy. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and they're, they're using the refrigerator argument. That, that was the argument they were using, the refrigerator argument. Like, what the hell? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm talking too much, but uh, yeah, people that are on Twitter and stuff, like social media, you know, uh, but thank you for this this work, and I'm, I'm glad this conversation is happening, and I hope you write an article combating all these sort of uh, BS lies. So thank you. Okay, Taryn, so do you want to summarize and then we'll move yeah. on to the next question? Yeah, sure. I mean, I really appreciate all the feedback. I think it's a lot of really rich discussion, first of all. So so to speak to, to Comrade Dante's point, it was funny because as I'm preparing for this, I am trying my hardest to, to actually put together like a working paper on what it is that I'm talking about, like what the broader critique is, but it got up to be like the last minute. And I was like, oh no, there's no way I can really rush through this in like a week. I need to just sort of put it aside and, and work on the presentation and what it is that I wanna cover for, for this venue. So yes, I do hope uh, sooner rather than later, ideally by the end of the summer to have like a longer paper uh, that I've had a bunch of people put eyes on and giving me feedback on that can kind of address these sorts of arguments because I just think it's really, I don't want, I mean, it's, it feels almost like a waste of time from where I'm sitting to even engage in these arguments, but you're right, because people have spent much more time online in the last year and a half, uh, and because people have been presented with some really stark and horrible realities about where capitalism is heading, especially during the pandemic time. It is, it's bad when people are encountering these, these sorts of attitudes online. And usually what I would say uh, to people who are, who are making these arguments is I would say, well, you know, maybe you should actually go ahead and like ask somebody from Cuba what they think, like somebody in the Cuban Communist Party, what they think, or maybe you should actually ask somebody in Palestine, you know, what, what they think about this and where they think 
you know, what, what the role is that, that people in, in the so-called uh, first world slash global north slash developed countries, et cetera, uh, core. I mean, there's so many different terminologies around it. But basically ask them where you think the role is, because they're not going to sit there and say that, well, actually, there's no possibility for revolutionary potential. I mean, when I've been traveling, it's always I hear from people, it's we understand it's not people, it's not the workers, it's the government, right? It's capitalism. It's the machine that you live in. And so I think that when you speak to people, you know, who are who are organized, not just anybody online, because anybody can go online and kind of pretend to be from anywhere in the world or from any kind of experience level or whatever. But if you actually want to do the research, if you actually want to get involved in these solidarity movements, they're going to tell you, oh, no, no, of course we want you to write to AOC. It doesn't matter if AOC called Venezuela a failed state on her Instagram live. Like, we want you to get a meeting with her. We want you to do whatever it is in your power uh, to sort of galvanize a movement to, to assist us and to sort of build solidarity. They'll say, yes, please go to your union. You know, and that's a part of the of the the critique that I didn't really address in this, where people will say that like even unions, even the you know the laborer soccer, all this stuff. So they'll say no, please go to your union and get your union to take a position on this. So when you actually talk to people who are in uh, heavily exploited areas, right, they're going to correct you a lot faster um, than whoever it is that's telling you that's telling you otherwise. So. I feel like you know that kind of that kind of ties into uh, this this mention about social media and whether or not it's worth our time. Like, yeah, I mean, sure. I just don't think that you should think of that as your primary field of struggle, though. I mean, I am honestly at the point in my life, I'm at the certain age where, like, I don't really want to waste a lot of time on people who are really just sort of entrenched in these ultra left ideas. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, you know, these anarchist ideas, these utopian ideas, like I'm, I'm not really interested in those people because they're generally coming, not always, right, because there are people who are coming from, from situations that are very difficult and these are the politics that they have, but you can find that a lot of them are kind of coming from like petty bourgeois backgrounds, right, that maybe they don't have a job, like, that we're talking about who it is that's being exploited, that they're not necessarily the, the exploited masses in in this country that that sometimes they're kind of removed from the working class in a way right so yeah i mean i think that social media is good if it's done in sort of a coordinated organized and highly critical way i look at there's a there's a professor at the university of havana named rol sanchez and he does a lot of media uh literacy work and i know that the ycl in uh these countries they are very focused on sort of educating people about the nature of social media that social media yeah it is a venue where we can have a discussion but it's also kind of corrupted by algorithms it's corrupted by censorship it's corrupted by you know all sorts of different mind games i mean there's a reason why at one point the state department wanted to put twitter in cuba um but cuba being reasonable and sort of living in the world as it is was like well we can't keep it out forever so we're going to do our best to sort of educate people about it so yeah i feel like social media is a good site for struggle either positive struggle where we make coordinated organized efforts and solidarity with people in other parts of the world i think that that has a huge payoff for 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 certain kinds of uh campaigns and areas of of struggle um and i think it's fine if you want to correct people you know and have these conversations but generally since it's all kind of done for clicks i feel like it's better to engage with social media in an organized and coordinated and critical way as opposed to just saying well once i tell this person off you know then the world will be fixed i mean that's how they keep on getting you to sign on to social media right that's why everybody's always checking their notifications on their phone because there's like a dopamine rush that happens with that so i think being critical about that um, is important and how to involve economic issues easier. I mean, I think you should talk about it. Um, you know, I think that one of the really sad things about um, where where our class is sort of deprived and oppressed in this country is that people don't really know a lot about basic economics. And, you know, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm able to, to tell people like, you know, the whole concept of explain it to me like you're five, because especially economics, it's such a specialized, uh, ivory tower kind of thing where there's a lot of jargon there's a lot of, of um, you know bs thrown around basically people dress up big 
you know, really simple concepts in like big complicated ways so that people aren't able to access that understanding. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that billions of people across the planet have understood basic economics. They don't know maybe what to call it, but then there's also people who were like not able to read, who understood economics enough to basically fight a protracted war, um, you know, in China or, or you know, be able to, to fight back against the Batista dictatorship and stuff. So like people do, you know, I feel like popularizing basic economics is a good way to sort of make those connections. And I feel like there needs to be a really close examination of how value is realized in the so-called first world, right? How like, yeah, a Verizon worker who's, and I always pick on the Verizon workers, I don't know why, but a Verizon worker who's standing around an eight hour shift, only two of those hours are actually spent, you know, selling things or, or, or checking out people at the register. Um, that their real productive capacity in some ways, and I need to think this through and I need to actually write it down, is that they're actually realizing that stolen value from the third world through their wages when they turn around and buy a phone or when they turn around and buy a microwave or when they turn around and buy you know, a new pair of jeans and stuff like, like that's the real reason why they are paid uh, so much more money than people in other parts of the world they don't get to hang on to that money, right? They don't They don't get to hang on to that money, but they definitely do get to sort of put it in Jeff Bezos's pocket because where else is he gonna get it, you know? And so anyway, I got a, I got a lot of thinking I do about that one. So I think popularizing economics is a good way to do it. Um, debt, you know, there needs to be a lot more work on debt just because of the exponential growth of a lot of debt markets. I feel like people are just sort of trying to, climb through it right now and come up with a decent analysis, but hopefully that's something that's gonna come through down the line. And as for the first point about not just wage inequality, but wealth inequality, especially as it breaks down um, with race um, and gender to a large extent too, because I don't think people understand that like credit cards are really new. Credit cards haven't been around forever. And that, you know, for instance, women weren't allowed to have credit cards until the, the mid seventies basically. Uh, free from any other kind of family involvement. Um, so I think that addressing wealth inequality and looking at how the wealth was sort of stolen at the beginning, that that's very, that's very important. Looking at the wealth inequalities between like, okay, yeah, so Jeff Bezos, he makes $87,000 a year, but that's not how he is so rich, right? That's not how he actually gets his money. Um, I think that addressing wealth is really important and how wealth is distributed. But I think that that also means that you have to be really careful in what it is that you qualify as wealth. Because yeah, of course, if you own a, a house that's worth $300,000, you know, is that because of an inflated market? Um, is that because we're on the precipice of another housing crisis? Is that, you know, how much, you know, there's a lot of different things that you need to kind of comb through when it comes to wealth. I think that conversation, I think that that analysis is really important, but that's not what he's addressing in, in his pieces. That's not what the ultra left is kind of addressing in these pieces. They're not, I mean, they do, to some extent, the ultra left will address like racial disparities because they'll say stuff like, well, you know, they'll say that people are, oh, sorry. They'll say that people are, um, you know that there are internal colonies inside of the United States, and I think that for a lot of a lot of like uh, indigenous populations, that like yeah, in, in part that's that's true, um, but they don't see them as being part and parcel of sort of a wider working class, right? That even though people are experiencing wealth disparities or wage disparities by by gender and race and nationality and and legal status, etc., um, they're not really wanting to make those connections, right? They're kind of wanting to, to keep things apart. I think that it's really important to critique those things, to viciously critique and like fight against those things. Um, but I think that you can also make the case to, to workers who are white that racism isn't in their benefit, you know, that it doesn't just sort of condemn them to death, uh, so to speak. So I, I hope that answered your question about the, the wealth and the, the wage thing. I just think it's noteworthy that that's not necessarily um, what comes up in discussion as much as rage does, so. So do you want to select from the questions that you uh, set, select one from the two questions that you have left? I know that there is a lot of interest, but we're kind of running out of time when it comes to yeah. dealing. There's so many things that we need to go over, including um, building, uh, well, generally the objective of, uh, putting our trust in uh, the masses versus one individual. 
So do you want to uh, take one of the questions and focus on on uh, one instead of trying to do the two? We're running out yeah. of time. I think, I think we can kind of collapse them into one question where it's basically what issues could we build you know, connections or unity around and, and maybe if people feel like they want to chip in, like what is the role of labor in that? Because I think people can get really frustrated sometimes if they think to themselves, well, you know, what do I do for a living if I don't show up to work at, at McDonald's? Is, is the world going to change? And I think that that demoralization has actually backed off a little bit because we can see across the country now that there's a lot of tension between trying to hire back minimum wage workers who are just not willing to go back to work for the wage as it stands. But we could probably collapse those two. Um, what are the okay. issues that we have? Okay. Yeah. So let's open the floor. The floor is open to for comments and and. Uh, for comments re uh, related to the question, the question is what issues could we build unity around and what is the role of labor? So I'm looking for uh, raised hands. Just click the picture of the hand if you'd like to speak and we will call. We will not be able to read uh, your written comments, so please, um, if you'd like to speak, please uh, click the picture of the hand so that we can call. Mushin, your mic is open. Molly, your mic is open. Mushin? Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Who who's speaking? This is this is Molly. Okay. Uh, briefly, please. Yeah. Um, what issues can we build unity around the role of labor? Um, so, police unions across this country have built have created these contracts with cities that basically are there to protect um, officer misconduct and officers who commit violence against black people um, and indigenous people. And so that's like a point of unity and, and labor's role in really separating, you know, what is a working class organization that um, defends working class people, working class values, um, i.e. a labor union and what is an association that, um, you know, a allows um, white supremacy um, and um, state sanctioned violence to proliferate in our communities. Um, I really hope that labor unions will, will join um, more and more. And I do see it in some capacity, though I'm not quite seeing it in Ohio. Um, these contracts need to be changed. They need to be amended. And I really think police officers should be members of unions with other emergency response workers instead of just, you know, we're we're our own thing. And because we have a gun and a badge. Um, OK, real briefly here with um, in terms of like defunding the police um, and shifting resources from um, occupying communities towards like supporting, you know, their well-being through social services, like unions who provide those social services uh, can join this movement in, in addressing um, police violence and, and, and supporting defunding in our city legislatures. Um, because yeah, you will get more jobs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mushin, your mic is open. Mushin, speak up, please. Okay, I'm closing your mic. Going through one more time, looking for raised hand. Uh, Violetta, your, uh, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end. Just click the picture of the mic to open it. Hi, um, Violetta is here, but uh, I'm here with her. <laughs> Good evening, nice show. <laughs> I'm Violetta. 
what's your do you have a comment uh, or yeah he's gonna he's gonna present it for me okay yeah um the piece the piece in terms of a uh, minimum wage i noticed that you had put that through so we typed it through uh, we're having some technical problems over here uh, with both of these machines we got. Uh, but you had noticed that the minimum wage is not exactly what it should be. And I'm wondering at this point, why is it that this isn't seen as a major issue? There aren't organizations. There are organizations fighting for minimum wage, but they're fighting for things like 15 bucks an hour which gives us about 30,000 a year as opposed to moving it forward. So how do we get people around this sort of an issue to move to, and with the labor unions as well, to move to the point that they would be a willing to fight for minimum wage that would be more like about 78, maybe $80,000 a year. And then some people may say that's unreal, but uh, we had an organization in Philadelphia Myself and Violetta, we went to their meetings and they were fighting for $12 an hour instead of 15. And, and everybody else was fighting for 15 at the time. Okay, thank you. Let's take one more. Okay, James, your mic is open. Click the picture of the mic on your control panel and it will open on your end. Just click the picture. There okay, hi. Hi, uh, this is James. Um, you know, there's one thing I've always wondered, um, uh, my colleagues uh, on this call, you know, have uh, I, I concur 100%. Why are we asking for fifteen dollars an hour when, when, when really seventy, eighty thousand is what uh, people need to have a home, a car, education? Even at times that doesn't meet everything. So that being said, hypothetically speaking, let's say we did uh, get those wage, and I hate to say concessions because they're not concessions but we get that wage justice here in America, what's to stop goods and services from escalating to where that amount of money workers are getting no longer buys what we were hoping it was going to buy? How, how do we control inflation so the raise in wages actually makes a difference? That's my question. Okay, Taryn. Again, really thoughtful, great feedback. Thank you all so much for contributing your, your thoughts. Um, so I think a lot of it is actually kind of tied together in how I would address this, because we're coming back to this issue of wages, right? So we're coming back to this minimum wage issue, but then we're stopping to consider inflation. And the way that I always teach about inflation is that it's displaced class conflict right? Because yeah, workers will organize, they will unionize, they will push hard for higher wages. And then yeah, generally what happens is that the uh, capitalist class who have made the concession, and I feel like it's fine to call it that they're making a concession to say, okay, fine, we'll pay everybody $15 an hour minimum wage. They need to maintain their level of profit that they have. And so they're going to turn around when they lose it on labor costs and they're gonna raise the prices of things. That's inflation, right? They're, that's the class conflict, it's displaced, right? So yeah, wages go up and then the price of goods go up, right? And we can we can talk about, I love, I love talking about inflation actually, but I won't get too much into it. But it kind of goes back to this question of, of what is it that you can buy? I think it's great that people are pushing for a $15 an hour minimum wage. I agree, it should be a $50 an hour minimum wage or whatever, right? Because we're not actually talking about what it is that people are bringing home in their paychecks. We're talking about what it is that $15 an hour is supposed to be able to buy you, right? 
or what it is that $80,000 a year is supposed to get you. And so I feel like for every discussion that we have about minimum wage, we should also be discussing how is it that we can increase public housing? How is it that we can uh, implement free or low cost public transportation to people? How is it that we can make college for your education free? How is it that we have universal access to healthcare, universal healthcare, right? I feel like those things, you know, wages, that's something that obviously people are really concerned with, right? I think it's interesting because in the Gundrisa, when Marx is uh, writing in the in capital, he starts off with this issue of the commodity. But when he's writing the Gundrisa, um, sort of like as his notes or his sketch or what have you for capital, he starts out with money as opposed to commodity, right? And I think that there are many different reasons for that. But the one that I always like to think of is it's because Marx was broke, right? And when you're broke, all you're thinking about is money. You're thinking about how much money you can get. You're not necessarily stepping back and thinking about the big picture. You're hungry. You need a place to live, so you're going to be worried about money, right? But money again is sort of a way of I don't want I don't want to say it's a red herring because obviously it's not, um, but it's a way of people being most concerned about being able to do stuff like get access to food, shelter, healthcare, education, um, etc. So I think that the discussion needs to be had about what is it that you need wages for? You know, if rent across the country were capped at a thousand dollars a month for everyone. Um, for a one bedroom apartment. I'm sorry, I'm coming from New York. So like, I know $1,000 is actually pretty expensive for most markets. Let's say $500, it's $250, right? For one bedroom apartment, it's capped across the country. Say everybody had access to free healthcare. Say everybody had access to free education. Say that everybody had access to free or low cost public transportation. Would we need to be thinking about raising the minimum wage? Maybe not, right? I mean, it'd be nice, but you know, when you look at workers in, in different countries, like like Cuba, for instance, where it's like, yeah, their take home wage is pretty low. Um, and of course, they're suffering terribly from a blockade that needs to be ended as soon as possible, um, if not yesterday. But at the same time, they have access to stuff like free education, free health care. They, they have a booklet, you know, that they go to. I don't know what they're up to right now, actually, because there's been a lot of economic changes. But, you know, you have access to food. You have access to shelter, you have access to education, you have access to healthcare. So it's like, yeah, what do you want? You wanna go and buy a, a, an Xbox? Yeah, you could probably do that if everything else was covered on, on a lot of the, the wages. I'm not saying that authoritatively. I don't wanna do all the numbers in my head. I'm just saying that like, the less you need to pay for, the less you need money. So it's like, yeah, maybe we should talk about what it is that people use that money for, right? Um, I think that that's a good way. To, to sort of approach the question of, of wages and of uh, money more generally. But that kind of ties into this comment about cop unions, which I thought was really uh, useful and instructive because I find that the, that the global struggle against the police or against police violence um, is something that's picking up a lot of steam everywhere. I remember in New York when, when, we, when we were having the protests against them raising um, the cost of a, of a ride, uh, that there was a lot of sort of cross-pollination between the very similar movement that was happening in Chile at the time where people were doing organized fair evasions, right? Um, it was also about police brutality. When we're watching police brutality on TV, we can, we can feel it, you know? People in many different parts of the world can feel it when they see police murder, or when they see police brutality. So I think that that is something that we can build a lot of, a lot of links with. Um, but I also think we need to, you know, include a discussion about the Pentagon, too, because talk about people who take your money. I mean, that's where 60 percent of the U.S. federal budget goes every year. It goes to the Pentagon. And what is it that the Pentagon does? Well, it goes and watches money. It goes and watches capitalists' interests overseas, right? So if we're talking about defunding the police because we see that uh, government more generally is not focusing on the things that it needs to be focusing on. I mean, for God's sake, look at the F-35 program, right? I mean, there's a lot of wasted money floating around out there. If people want to use it as a vehicle for innovation, just off, open up an office of innovation, of scientific innovation. You don't have to go and, and you know, build giant death machines in order to come up with human ingenuity. Um, and I think that that can be a way of, of building some significant solidarity um, internationally because yeah like we don't like well I don't know people have different reasons for not liking the Pentagon 
I have a lot of reasons I don't like the Pentagon, but one of the reasons is because it soaks up so much money that could be better spent elsewhere. It soaks up so much priority that could be better uh, given elsewhere, right? And people all across the world are gonna be cheering if we say, well, we wanna cut the Pentagon budget in half. We wanna abolish the Pentagon. Like these are these are things that also have sort of global ramifications. And you know, I think that it is worthwhile to, to sit there and, and struggle within the unions, struggle within organized labor to have these conversations. It's like, you know, why is it that these are the last unions seemingly that have almost total control over, over bargaining power at the end of the day. Yeah, because they got guns, right? I mean, the NYPD runs New York in a lot of ways because that's the largest police force in, I don't think the world, but you know, they get $6 billion a year. So that's a good way to have a conversation about what we can build international links with and what the role of labor could be. So I really appreciated all of the the stuff that people were talking about. So thank you guys so much for giving me the feedback. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, you know, I don't know, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Taryn Fivik and DM me or something. Just if you want to, if you have any other feedback, because I'd be really interested in building on this. And like I said, I'm interested in writing a larger paper and, and doing some, some deeper work on this. So thank you again, everybody. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you, Tuck Taryn, for being the facilitator on this topic. And we uh, will do uh, classes in the future to consider uh, different angles as we try to build and grow and advance our collective work. So thank you everyone for participating. Hope to see you uh, at our future activities. Uh, thank you um, again, Taryn, and good night.